Okay, today is number four. We are rounding up uh, the big picture that I've been trying to give all week. And so I'm going to what is in some ways seems to be the farthest away from language uh, that you can get, which is uh, dealing with places and venues and positioning. And so that's um, the point of this talk today. And I'm still going to talk start with this thing here to communicate is to make common. And this is for Nils, because he hasn't heard any of this. I've been making this point all week. And uh, this, I, I just said that to make it common to you and me. And it's now common to you and me. Um, but where do we make things common? And does the location where we make things common, is that important at all? And how do we use those places as a way of doing what we do jointly. Notice that joint activities, again, I haven't dropped that idea, and joint activities occur in a place. So uh, let's look at all these joint activities. So there, I'm going to put out these, which I've, I think I've discussed every one of these, uh, depositing money in a, a bank, buying groceries, playing a piano duet, getting married, playing chess, lecturing students, eating lunch, playing tennis. These are all nice, neat joint activities. But if you look and you say, well, gee, they all occur in particular places or venues. Uh, uh, and um, bank lobbies, grocery stores, piano rooms, churches, living rooms, classrooms, restaurants, tennis courts, hallways. I mean, actually, gossip can <coughs> uh, go anywhere. So these are the venues, the big kind of uh, places that things are done in, but they themselves consist of or have places within them that is smaller, what I think of as simplex places, um, like the teller window and queues, a uh, checkout counter, a piano on a bench, um, a chancel and a nave. Uh, these are parts of churches, uh, chessboard, chairs, you know, there are, are all of these very particular places that occur in uh, in all of these venues, and, and they're, they're used as part of, uh, sorry, but I knew you would do something nice about it. Uh, so the question is, what is the relation of all of this stuff uh, to um, the, the, the argument that I've been making all week, which is you communicate in order to carry out joint activities? Uh, so um, I'm going to talk about the role of places and venues here where people communicate by positioning. Positioning all sorts of things. Uh, you're going to go out and tell them to stop the music? <laughs> now, I used to play in a band like that. I'd love to be out there doing it right now, but you're much more important, so we're, we'll stay here. Uh, so people communicate by positioning these things, physical objects, they position themselves, they position actions in places, very particular places like in cans, boxes, containers, on tables, uh, at windows, counter, they do all that kind of stuff, which are themselves in larger venues, um, shops, classrooms, restaurants, and so on. This is the topic today, and I'm trying to figure out how to get you into this and make it clear that this is extremely important part of ordinary everyday communication. Positioning is what I'm really going to talk about. And I'm going to, uh, I've had this theme all week of the wedding between these two people here. Uh, again, that was for Nils. Um, and uh, they are William and Kate. But here we have three different places that they that we see in their wedding. Uh, well, if we think about the placement, what they have done is they place themselves in chairs or before the altar at the entrance. These are very important parts of the wedding ceremony. But they have oriented themselves in particular ways. That is, facing out, facing the altar, or facing the outside in there at the entrance. And they have configured their bodies in particular ways. And you can configure other things in other ways. I mean, you could call this um, posture, uh, but in the general sense it's configuring, sitting, kneeling, or standing. So there, uh, those three places, those three forms of positioning contrast on those features. 
and they are going to uh, loom large in what I'm going to argue. However, I'm going to really focus mostly on placement, although I'm going to mention these other things as we go along. Um, so, pointing versus placing. Uh, there's a, I gave a paper a, a number of years ago on pointing versus placing, and um, I start out saying, well, everyone knows everything about pointing, so I'm going to spend all this talk on placing. <laughs> and so the, the paper was not about pointing, it was about placing, and that's what I'm going to do here. So let's start with a real example of Cameron uh, speaking in front of the White House, uh, and here's Obama. This again is a theme I've had all week of Cameron and Obama. This is uh, how you do this. Uh, they're both English speakers, so I can understand what they're saying. Um, here's so I am a little embarrassed as I stand here to think that 200 years ago, my ancestors tried to burn this place down. <laughs> now looking around me, I can see you've got the place a little better defended today. You're clearly not taking any risks with the Brits this time. Uh, so, good Cameron humor, uh, and happily Obama thinks it's humorous. So, but if you look at what's happening here, uh, Cameron is indexing all kinds of stuff in their local um, situation, their, their local, uh, in their venue, is the, the way I'm going to talk about it here. All the stuff in red are ways of anchoring to that particular place. Uh, and they do it, uh, uh, they do it, they, they're anchoring the participants. He's doing the, the, everything that he says is anchored to them. So the participants are I, me, my, and you, your, and looking at Obama, but also the place and the time. So here, this place around me, and this kind of gesturing that he does, uh, time 200 years ago, now, today, this time. All of these things are anchoring uh, the, the, the speech and the, the language, the communication is being used to that situation, to that venue, that place. And the question is how this is all done. Well, the obvious ones are pointing. So uh, Cameron turns to Obama. Uh, he stretches out his arms and says, this place he produces I, me, and my, and as I talked about yesterday, these are ways of um, uh, anchoring himself, uh, sorry, his talk to himself. Um, he produces here for his location, produces now and today. These are pointers. Uh, and uh, Mariana and I had this conversation whether these are, this is pointing or not, it's irrelevant. Just think of them as pointers of some sort. They're indexes. Uh, but he also places himself in various ways, or positions himself. So he puts himself at the podium. Now that's basically to say that he's the orator. He's now the person who's giving the talk at that time. He puts himself, Obama puts himself over on one side as to say that he's a listener. They, uh, the White House uh, puts a podium in the Rose Garden. I mean, there's a podium there and is placed there by the White House. I mean, there are people there. And that's to say, this is where this whole speech is going to happen. It makes the venue. It is the way of uh, sort of organizing the venue. There's a soldier in back. I don't know if you remember this guy. He's standing there with a British, soldier, with a British uh, um, flag. Uh, and uh, it's basically saying he's a part of the honor guard of that ceremony. Um, and he's holding this Union Jack in front of him and basically saying, <laughs> why the Union Jack as opposed to the American flag? Well, because Cameron is our guest. And so it's, uh, it has its uh, purpose for having the Union Jack there being placed there. Um, and there's a whole lot of other stuff. Uh, so the, what I did in this original uh, paper that I wrote was to, to try to distinguish between these two kinds of indexing, basically. Uh, pointing to where you, you're really trying to locate something else. Um, you're pointing to, he, for example, Cameron points to Obama to indicate Obama's his addressee, and uh, Cameron points to himself as to indicate that he's a speaker, but he also positions himself and other things. So he stands at the podium to say, I'm, I'm the person speaking here. 
And Obama stands to one side saying, I'm not the person who's speaking here, I'm the person who's listening. That is, these positionings that they're doing are part of the communications being done in these um, venues. So uh, all I can say is yesterday, you know, we believe we know what pointing is. Well, boy, we don't know what placement is, I'll tell you that, if we think we know what pointing is. So um, I'm going to talk about placement as a communicative act. And um, uh, the other thing is I'm, I'm going to give a prize to the person who figures out why I'm using this map here. And I mean a serious prize, I'm going to give a beer. Uh, but you have to be able to figure this out. I know where the back is wrong. Sorry? Well, no, no, hold on. You're not, nothing allowed here because all of these people have, they're part of the competition too. Um, so placement is the act of putting an object at a place for a partner to interpret. This is the argument that I'm going to make. And a place is a specialized uh, place that has an interpretation. It's a location of an interpretation. So take, this is a checkout counter at a simple grocery store. It is a place, and it's a place where you can put things on and take things off and all kinds of stuff. So that is the, that's the notion of place here. But uh, even this place right here, I mean, I've, I pointed this one right here, but it's full of places. So there's a place for the clerk behind the counter. There's a place for items that are already rung up, which are back here, the items that are going to be uh, rung up right here. The current customer stands right here. The people who are waiting stand there. There are locations that are used all over the place. So these different places each have a different sort of interpretation in this uh, situation here. Um, yes. Uh, here is, uh, uh, even I went to a restaurant called the left bank, and it's in Menlo Park. You'll be glad to know that because uh, left, uh, Menlo Park is where uh, Facebook started. It started probably not very far from this restaurant. Anyway, uh, just take that table. That table is a place, but it's got a bunch of sub places in it. So it's got this area right here, which I'm calling area one, and that's for, um, well, the table is for items for diners at that table. I mean, it's basically that's. Things that are put on that table are for those diners that are sitting at the table. This area one here is for items for the diner who's sitting at that place. Uh, the chair is for him. There's a chair over there that you can barely see. There's a wine glass there. Uh, and that's for the wine for that guy. And uh, if you think of uh, beside the table, is a waiter will come up and stand beside the table. And that is a place for the waiter. The waiter doesn't come and sit down at the table or, you know, there are things that are done by placement, by positioning. In this case, I'm talking about the placement here. And the center table are items for any diner at the table. So there's a wine, there's a wine menu in the middle and that's anybody can pick it up. Uh, Q is one of the really great ones because it's for people. Uh, and this is a queue in, at Starbucks in uh, Watsonville, California. And uh, you can see that there's a rank order of these things. So the queue is for people waiting for service. So you put yourself in the queue to say, I am waiting for service. But you, uh, you know that your rank in the queue tells you what order you are for the service. So the person with first rank gets, their, gets served first and so on. Uh, I'm going to come back to those sorts of things here. I'm now going to turn to me going into the Stanford bookstore to buy a book. And so I'm going to give you this as a, I'm going to try to go through the whole example here. So here I am placing a book on the counter at this bookstore for this woman here who's behind the, she's the clerk. Um, and what am I doing here? Well, I am just, by doing that, this, this is just a standard Saucerian display. Um, I've got a, I'm positioning the book on that counter. That's what that little notation is supposed to mean. And what does it say? Well, the content of that um, signal is I'm saying that that book is um, an item as part of this, um, this uh, 
commercial exchange that we're taking part in. And I'm saying that the book is a member of that, of that um, set. And that's what I'm doing by doing this. That is, I, to place this item on this counter is to specify this item as to be bought here, as an item to be bought here. That's what I mean when I put that book on that book on that counter. Now, most people don't think of this as communication. I mean, it's just, but it's just standard, absolutely straightforward communication here. Um, and I'm, I want to point out one thing that it took me a long time to figure out. That so notice that indexing. I say that is Marianne. Marianne. I can never pronounce this right. So Marianne is going to be Marianne. Um, now that is, I have just one index. This is an index and she is the person index. This has two indexes. Uh, so all of these, so pointing has one index and placement always has at least two. And once you get into orientation, it's got a third and various other things. But I place this item, this book, on this counter. So it's the, the, I, I, am, I actually am indexing two things at once with that um, action. And that's, uh, and that's how it's interpreted here. So let's look at these things. So it says that this is an item in exchange. I mean, the interesting thing is I put a book on, the, on that counter, but she puts the book on the counter too. And I put some money on the counter, and she put some money on the counter. And I, I put um, other things on the I put, a, let's say, a credit card on the counter, and she puts on a... Uh, you know, a receipt on the counter. That is, the counter is a place where all of the stuff that goes into the uh, commercial exchange that you're uh, engaged in get put. And so I'm putting here, so item exchange, there's a book for the clerk, uh, money for payment, receipt to customer, book in the bag. She puts it in the bag and then she puts it there and then I take it away. So depending on where you are in that joint activity, that same place gets, uh, gets a different interpretation. So the interpretation depends on where you are in that larger joint activity. That should not be lost on you either because that's the way things go in general. That is, uh, interpretations always are relative to where you are in the joint activity that you're engaged in here. So uh, here I want to, uh, I'm going to take I mean, this is this is this is just to whet your appetite. Um, uh, in this uh, this this case that I was have been looking at uh, in the last three or four days, these two guys putting together this TV stand. I'm going to show you. They use place placement all over the place, all over the. Uh, they use it a lot. <laughs> um, so watch here. This is, this is um, how they, they, she places, she's going to do something with a screwdriver. So she puts a screwdriver in a location, it's an ad hoc uh, location, that's between the two of them. And that's recognized as a place that is accessible to both her and him. And he, she puts it there, and then when he wants it, he just picks it up. Not this next, so that's the, what I've called here, items for either person. But here, apparently that guy was waiting for it. Now, they may have been doing the same thing, but it was picked up right away. Not in this next case. Uh, here is, uh, she puts out her hand and he puts the screwdriver in the hand. Uh, that's a place, his hand is a place, and she is putting it in a place to say, I am transferring this to you. Now, of course, she is transferring it to him physically, but that is uh, an indication of the way she's doing it. What you, I want you to notice here, one thing, it is remarkable, I've, I found watching these things, how well these guys are able to do it. Uh, she doesn't, he doesn't just give, put the uh, screwdriver to her in any old way. He turns it such that it goes handle first, that is, it's, uh, configured in just the right way so that she gets it right. So here. I, I just find this remarkable because in the next one, that isn't what happens. We got two inept people. Now, first of all, 
He wants the screwdriver. He points at it for her. He doesn't say, I'd like the screwdriver. He points at it for her. And then she puts it out, and then he takes it from her hand. She doesn't hand it to him, if you watch very closely. Uh, and that's a different kind of, uh, I'm going to come back to these different forms of placement. That's a different sort of placement there. The point is, we, these are just common things that we do in all these, uh, these sorts of things as a way of getting things done. It's a kind of communication that's done. So he points the screwdriver, she exhibits the screwdriver, she says, here it is, uh, and then he deplaces it for her, from her hand. So, um, uh, the point, uh, at, I hope you've all seen this already, is that there are two large classes of things that you can position. One of them is people, one of them is objects, uh, items like this, so a book, money, wine, food, these are things that we've seen here, but you also find people placing themselves, so the customer in four counter, the customer in a queue, the customer behind, or the server behind the counter, the diner sits at a chair. These are all uh, placements of the self. Um, and these are, this is just common. You see all of these all over the place. So there's nothing, um, yeah. So the act of placement then goes something like this. You display uh, an item in a place and that gives you this content here. Um, and that's the schema, and when I did it with a book, this is really what happened. So I stick the book there, and it, it has that property. Now, that's just to summarize what I've been saying. Now, uh, okay, Nils, you're, you're, you're allowed to look at this. Um, I, how do you interpret these placements? I mean, what goes into the interpretation of these placements? And it took me a while to figure out that these are really not simple. Um, and uh, the, one of the points here is that places belong to hierarchies, and so I'm going to take uh, the left bank here as uh, an example here, and we're going to look at the table. So there's this table here is, let, let me call it table number 19, and it belongs to this restaurant called the left bank. But uh, there's the wine menu. It this wine menu belongs not to just any table, belongs to table 19. And the setting here, which is this one over here, remember setting one, belongs to that table. So table 19 has a setting one, and uh, there are knives and forks at that setting, and there are napkins at that setting, there's a glass at that setting, there's a chair at that setting, and this is really the way the hierarchy looks. So it's, it says there's a restaurant, there's a dining room, there's a table 19, and there, here's the first setting, and it's got all these things at the setting. Now, ask yourself what it is that I do when I sit at, in this chair right here, that chair, uh, which is that chair right there. I sit in it. What have I just done? Well, uh, here's what you do. You say, Clark sits in chair one, but that actually commits him to uh, sitting, to dining at setting one at table 19 of the left bank. That is, it's a whole chain of commitments that you're making by doing this one simple um, placement here. And the, the waiter is doing something very similar. When he pours wine in the glass one, so that there's a glass one up there and he pours wine into it, well that glass of wine, that isn't for Eve who's sitting over there, uh, it's for me. And it's for, in fact, the person who is at setting one of table 19 of the left bank. And that, there's a, in fact, what this does is just set some obligations there that is I will have to pay for the wine that's stuck there by this waiter because I am sitting at that table, at that, you know, at that place. So there are the simple placements of, uh, by, done by the waiter and done by me uh, put these uh, commercial obligations up in very complicated ways that I haven't even broached here in this kind of thing here. The point is that these interpretations are, uh, it isn't just I'm sitting someplace, I am sitting and committing myself to these uh, things. This is the particular, this case here. Timing, and uh, so I was talking about timing a lot yesterday and I didn't get into a bunch of timing, but let's look at timing here because uh, this is really interesting. 
I'm going to start with a distinction of saying, look, all signals have a time course, and this is really something that all, uh, most of my friends miss, I mean, because we are constantly interested in transient signals, basically. So I say, hi, and that's transient, it's gone. I mean, it's, it's got a little, it's got a little um, uh, time course there, and she's coming as a little bigger time course. Uh, gestures, um, anyway, there, but there are a lot of cases where they're iterated signals, so you say, and, 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 and he's coming tomorrow. So I'd said and four times there. Doing something by saying it four times. And uh, Tom Wasso and I have a paper all on how often you say he. So he, he, he's interested in that. So I've said he three times. Why did I iterate these things? Gestures are often iterated. So I'm going like this. I can nod three times, 10 times. Uh, iterated signals are then distinct from transient signals. Sustained signals are ones where you apparently, they're, they're in gestures they're called holds. So I point and I hold, uh, and it just sits there. With pointing and eye gaze, you can do it very easily. With speech, it's hard because there are not many things that you can hold very long. So I say, ah. Uh, now, I got about, what, two seconds worth of ah uh, there, and it's hard to do otherwise. Uh, it, yeah, and, and yes, this is also, did I just do one? No. Ah, but that is one. So, and, and of course, uh, tapping, you can sit there and do all kinds of stuff. Um, but there are also permanent signals. I mean, I walk in with a shirt and a tie on, and this is to tell you that I am the person who's speaking up here in front today. <laughs> uh, so clothing, uniforms, the almost, uh, people wear what they wear, and they have tattoos and they have hairstyles and all sorts of stuff that tell you that these are permanent ways of signaling various things about them. Uh, each of these different time courses have a different property. Um, anyway, here's, here's what happened. I was, the, the, the real analogy you can see is in the, on the road. So honking is transient. Uh, iterated signals like the left turn signal on your car it sits there and blinks, and it blinks, and it blinks until, uh, and sustained signals are things like a red light. It's sustained until it turns green and then you go. Uh, a stop sign is just permanently there. It is there, and you get up to it, and then you have to stop. Uh, and all of these are interpreted in different ways, really different ways. So one of the, um, although this, it's not true of this building, but you have a, a sign over the men's room and it says men's. Well, now, how do we think about that? Do we walk up and we say, oh, it's saying men, 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 and it's going on. Or it just says men once and, or it's only useful, or we think of it as a, a transient signal that it's only transient and there when I glance at it and say, ah, it says men. There is no logic that I know about that discusses the differences in these um, kinds of time frames. So uh, that's neither here nor there. It's, but you'll see that it makes a difference with pointing and placing. So let's start with uh, this woman here. So she's, uh, this is some, a bunch of recordings we've, uh, this is Meeja van der Weegen and I did a number of years ago and we still haven't written any of this up. Uh, but we have lots of, wonderful examples of people pointing in certain ways. And here's a case where they, uh, this is a couple, and they were engaged, either engaged or married. Uh, we did a bunch of these couples. And they're putting, uh, they're basically um, furnishing a house. And this is a, a, a floor plan of a two-story house, uh, ranch-style California house. So it's not the kind that you're going to have around here. But still, you'll see. And um, so here's what she says. Okay. Is this up here, these are blank rooms. Mm -hmm. So, a lot. Now, what happened here? So she, uh, she says, and this up here, these are blank rooms. And then she waits 3.13. So she holds, this is a hold. She holds it. So this is a sustained signal. Um, uh, she holds it for three seconds. What is she, why is she holding it for so long? Listen again. Okay. Is this is here, these are blank rooms. 
Mm -hmm. So, when did she stop or hold? Sorry? That's, you got it, you got it. And there we are here. So, uh, Susan up here, her name is not Susan, her name is Susan. And she prepares her point. Actually, she does it before she starts her utterance. So you can see her already uh, preparing her arm to do the pointing. And then she says, and this up here, these are blank rooms. The pointing actually starts right at, at the middle of the word blank. Um, and so the, the, what, what I have here in boldface is the time that is covered by that. And it starts over here, and she sustains it for three, uh, actually four seconds here. But he comes along and at some point says, mm-hmm. And then she lifts up her finger um, uh, half a second later, and uh, she retracts it there, and then, uh, then goes on and says, so. So this kind of phenomenon happened regularly in this thing that we um, as we went through it, because you can see exactly when they start touching, and you can ex see exactly when they retract their touch. So it was a nice um, place in which to do this, but this has properties that you do not see people discussing much, uh, or at least this kind of interactive phenomenon, at least as far as I could tell. Um, and let's see, how do you the way to think about this is to say, okay, she initiated her pointing at a particular p moment, and she maintained it for a long period of time, and she then terminated at a particular time. So pointing always, as far as I can see, and this is true for these things that can be done and held, uh, they always have these three phases to them, and the phases do not mean, the phases have their own interpretation. So. The first, uh, the initiation says, she is saying to him, I want you to attend to this room. And so she holds her finger there. That's, and it's from now on, actually, is what she's saying. And she maintains this to say, and if he ever looked over, he's always, he says, I, I see that she's continuing to want me to attend to this room. That is, that's the, the meaning of this maintenance. But then, once she terminates it, she says, I no longer need you to, or care, or want you to, probably need you to attend to this room. So there are these three phases, and they have interpretations of their own. And this is absolutely standard for placement and pointing. Um, so the time here is, uh, the, it's also the case in the bookstore. So I go in there, and I place this down. Well, as long as it's in that place, it says, uh, what does it say? It says, I want to buy this book. And as soon as it's deplaced, then I no longer want to buy this book. Uh, well, so the way to think about this is, as of now, I intend to buy this book, and I maintain it there. I continue to want, intend to buy the book, and then I no longer intend to buy it. In fact, I, I might look in my wallet and say, Gee, I don't have enough money for this book, and I take the book off the counter. I no longer, that's the deplacement here, I no longer intend or want to buy this book. And that's what you're saying when you deplace it from this. But of course, what else happens? She deplaces it from this. And so, uh, but that's not the I. So she's not doing the, I'm not doing the deplacement, she's doing the deplacement. And for that, she is starting up here as of saying, I, as of now, I am treating you as, in, as um, as committed to buying this book. And that commitment only starts when she moves it from my having placed it there to her uh, doing something with it. Uh, in this case, in, a, in the grocery store, you actually move it to another place, as if the place that it's in tells you whether it is to be bought or already committed to be bought. So uh, in, that, in this way. Um, now, this turns out to be true of just any of these maintained signals. You can do this with, um, so I'm now committed to doing something. I continue to be committed. I am no longer committed. That's what these uh, different phases mean in general. Uh, now, can you do this? Well, it's really, uh, so only some signals can be maintained. 
and they are the iterated ones and the sustained ones. Uh, the iterated ones, uh, you can laugh, you can say ah, uh, ah, uh, uh, and uh, you can do sort of, tr uh, you can do this for a little bit with um, vocal signals, but you can really do it with these gestural signals. So things that you do with your hand um, or head nodding, you can continue doing head shaking, tapping. Um, sustained ones over here, you can only sustain speech for a very little bit, but you can sustain pointing and placement and touching and this kind of thing for a long time. You stand in a queue. Uh, I don't know how much time I spend when coming here by air, how much of my time I've spent standing in a bloody queue. Uh, but I, I am doing this always to, of course, maintain the, I'm maintaining my uh, uh, desire to commit myself to getting on that plane, and that's what you have to do to, uh, by standing in the queue. Smiling is something that you can sustain for quite a period of time, and that, uh, you know, putting it on a smile and taking off a smile, they have the same sorts of properties. Okay, so uh, the, the, the other point I want to make about um, these maintained signals is, for example, uh, here's a, a girl in class, this is, I gave this yesterday, and uh, the teacher is saying, um, who knows the capital of North Dakota? And um, is there anyone in this room who knows the capital of North Dakota? <laughs> well, or South Dakota for that matter. <laughs> Sorry? Um, so, but she's going to raise her hand until she's called on. And as soon as she's called on, she will lower her hand because uh, she doesn't want to say, I continue to want to answer that question after she is answering the question. That is, this is a signal to say, I am uh, up to wanting to answer your question. Um, a host offers guests drinks, so I will hold out this tray until Marianne takes a drink off of this tray, and then I will move and go someplace else. That is, it's something that you do until it, uh, till the until this object has been deplaced. Um, a beggar is constantly holding out something until money gets put in it, and then she'll take her hand, put it away. Um, OK. Now, that's placement. Uh, and, and there have been bits of, uh, of orientation and configuring in the examples that I've given, but not big ones. Um, one I, I should have pointed out while I was there, the waiter, when the waiter puts a menu in front of me, uh, it's, he doesn't just flop it on, the, on my placemat there. He puts it such that it is oriented toward me so that the, I, if I open it up, there it is, and uh, it's right side up. Now, that's configuring of a kind or orienting. These are sometimes hard to distinguish. Um, but he's doing it because he is signaling this is for me to use as a menu. Uh, so let's go uh, back to these guys here. I'm just going to play this again, and then we're going to go through uh, some of the things that they did here. So I am a little embarrassed, as I stand here, to think that 200 years ago, my ancestors tried to burn this place down. Now looking around me, I can see you've got the place a little better defended today. You're clearly not taking any risks with the Brits this time. Now, what is really interesting to me uh, of this little excerpt here is how he uses orientation. So he's, he's uh, first of all, he's placed himself at that podium, and that's, he's now the speaker. And uh, Obama's placed himself over to this one side to say, I am a bystander listening to you um, give this address. But what does he do with his body? He does all sorts of things by orienting it. So the first thing he does is to face the audience out there. And basically, this is to say, you are my audience. Basically, it's a way of telling the audience who the addressees are. And notice he can't do with his eyes, eye gaze alone, because there's no way that he can look at all the people in the eyes who are in the audience. But he can face the audience, and facing the audience will do that. Um, and Obama does virtually the same thing. He doesn't face the audience out there. He faces Cameron. 
And that's a way of saying, I am listening to you. Um, yeah, I'm listening to you. Now, all of a sudden, he turns his head. This is uh, Cameron to Obama, but he doesn't turn his torso. Um, so he reorients his head alone to say uh, he's going to designate Obama temporarily to be the addressee, but not permanently because he doesn't turn his torso. He only turns his head. So anybody who's ever read a paper by uh, Shagloff called Body Torque, this is what he discusses in this paper here. Um, so uh, that, so there's, and, and then we don't see any change over there, but over here now, uh, Cameron now looks down at his, this is now what I think of as reconfiguration, he looks down at his um, text, and that's to say that temporarily I am not attending to you in the audience. I am attending to this uh, piece of paper. Of course, he has to do it because he has to read the damn thing, but that's, uh, so this temporary, uh, and, but Obama is, uh, he faces down to signal his appreciation. And the way I, at least the way I would think about this, it isn't that he's facing down. What he's doing is reconfiguring his body in a way to say, uh, okay, uh, we, don't, we aren't looking at each other anymore and I'm appreciating what you're doing. That is only for the audience out here because he doesn't see it. Um, then there's no change and Obama now faces the audience to share this joke. So uh, Obama's sitting here and he goes like this. That's simply, and it's temporary, because he then puts his head back, is to say, I'm with you guys out there, this is a funny joke. Um, so the way to think of this is that there are these facet indexes that I talked about yesterday, uh, where the face uh, is picking out Obama, but the torso is another facet, and it is simultaneously picking out the audience. And the torso, as uh, Shagelaw pointed out, is the thing that is the permanent part it's the permanent conversation you're carrying out, whereas the, only, the temporary one is with the face. Uh, here he has the head and torso, so he's indexing the whole thing. Um, and so that's, so this is, Cameron's head is temporarily torqued. So it's, it's a really great, uh, I, I mean, I, I really admire this analysis of Shagloss. So I have my head this way, it's torqued. It's out of its ordinary position, it feels wrong. I mean, it's. It can't be, I can't sit here and talk like this the whole time. I have to, it should be straight ahead. So it's marked to have it out on the side. And that is to say, that's what makes it only temporary. Um, but here is uh, Obama reconfiguring his posture. And in doing that, uh, he's showing, this is not, uh, again, it's a marked um, configuration. Uh, it's temporary. And it's time to follow this joke, and it signals appreciation. Um, so uh, now, notice that I've just given you this one example explicated. No one that I know of has done this in any great detail uh, to show how these, these sorts of signals work. So placement, a summary. So let, let me do a quick summary here. Um, it's an index uh, to an object, actually, <laughs> As I just said, it was two indexes. Um, but it works by specifying interpretation for the object. So I put something on a, a, a checkout county that says this is something I want to buy. Uh, it exploits interpretations of places, hierarchies, precision timing that is beginning and the ends of these placements. And it's often combined with orienting and, and uh, configuring. OK, I, those are, let me call them simplex places. But these simplex places are parts of big venues. Um, so venues are basically com compound places. I was about to say compound places. Um, so uh, as we, this is what I've just been showing you. Uh, these are places for objects and cells, but the venues actually are places for joint activities per se. That is, uh, you play basically concerts, shoe stores, buying, selling shoes, kitchens, preparing meals, church, and so on. So you think of a venue as a place where bigger act joint activities go on. But of course, they nevertheless consist of a bunch of uh, smaller simplex places, among other things. So let's look at this. So here's, let's take the good old bookstore. 
So we're going to start with a counter, and that's the counter. And we're going to put a place for the server and the customer. There's the customer and there's the server. Um, remember, that's me over there and that's that server that you saw earlier. And then there is a space for interaction. And uh, we can interact, we interact partly over the counter, but it's also, there's a little interactive space typically, and this may not be a good visualization of it here, but it's in general, that's what you've got. And then there is a no man's land. That is, there are places, it's a, a little bit of, around uh, this, this space here that other people are not supposed to intrude on. That is, this is for her and me, and if you get too close, for example, you don't dare get between me and the customer, uh, me and, and this counter. In fact, you don't get in here. You don't, there's, a, there's some kind of area that is just considered, let me call it, the surround. And it's a no man's land, something where you don't go. So now, what happens here is I, uh, we, we do all of the stuff that we do, this uh, server and I, by placement. So I, she places herself there, and what does she mean by that? She means, I'm ready to serve someone. Not, not, not anyone in particular, just people. Uh, this is kind of a, what I'm going to call here a standing um, commitment. She's got a standing commitment to help people come up. I then place myself right there, and then I say, I'm ready to be served, and then I put a book on the, book, on the counter right there, and I say, I want to buy this. Uh, that's, so we've done all this by placement. We can do this in Japan, and I've done this many times, or, or uh, places that I have no notion about the language. I do exactly this, and it all works just the way you think it ought to work, because this is all done. Uh, I mean, th these are kind of conventions, I guess. Um, it's a good question. Whether they're, yes, they're more or less conventions. Anyway, uh, so acts of placement here. So this is... Uh, I've, I'm just ex explicating what I've said before. That is, these are things that you get from uh, placing things in various parts of that uh, thing. Now, uh, years ago, I recorded myself going into a, uh, a, a drugstore, and I stood at a counter, and I placed some soap and shampoo on the counter, and I looked at the server who was behind the counter, and she was... Um, uh, she was, she, I, well, she gazed at me and she says, I'll be right there. And I say, okay. But then she was checking an inventory. And so she goes back and goes and she's checking this inventory for 15 seconds. Now, I don't know whether the, the, uh, this is a nice thing for servers to do, but then that's what she did. And then she came over and faced me and then uh, was clear. She didn't know what I, was, what I wanted. And so I then manifest, she's manifestly looking for the items to be rung up, and I point those right there, I say. And I then, I say these two things right over there, the server deplaces the shampoo from the counter and rings it up, and on it goes. Okay, so we can see I'm placing myself there. She had placed herself there, but she actually had uh, kind of distanced herself and was doing something else. Various things that we did here. Now, these... Uh, the things in blue are done with placement or pointing. Uh, and they're distinct from the spoken signals. The point I really want to make with this example is uh, if you're a traditional uh, analyst of a discourse, the only thing that you count as part of the discourse is this, this, and that. Uh, as if somehow that's the discourse. And I say, Nonsense, this is just wrong way of thinking about that. I'm standing there and it is a sustained signal. That doesn't mean it's, uh, it's just as much of a signal as just one that's sustained all the way through there. And it's saying, I continue to be considered, to, I, consider, I continue to consider myself a customer here. And I place these things on the counter. They're there for a long time. Um, one, so you have two views of what's going on here. One of them is to say, okay, you've got, I'll be right there, okay, these two things over here. That's the discourse, and everything else is the context. Now, that seems to me just brutally uh, screwing up what actually is going on here. That is, 
the placement and the gazing and the standing and these are all signals too that are intrinsic to what you're doing in that discourse it isn't just context it isn't just background this is these are things that she and I did and they were active pieces of um, of signaling okay standard venues are all over the place so uh, when you think of a venue you typically think of standard venues like the checkout venue this one that I was showing you here there's a checkout counter here or a dining table here I uh, hope you recognize that one um, Monop games game boards so monopoly boards a monopoly table as you can see there are uh, uh, four players here there's a monopoly board how do you play monopoly you play monopoly by putting things on places in that board the board is a highly a standard standardized uh, game board for placing things on uh, and that's where you do it and there, there are these interactive spaces and there's an uh, you know these outside things here that's just as true for Scrabble and for Monopoly um, for what's what's this game here pardon me backgammon thank you it's the Swedish accent here um, and this is chess uh, chess is done entirely by placing things so you move a pawn out you don't have to say anything it's all done with movement and placement that's the game the game is done by placing things that's the way you do it and there's also a configuration problem you can turn uh, you put your queen on or your king on the side and that means that you're giving up doesn't mean you're giving up or you're conceding some anyway uh, there are some of that uh, tennis I mean tennis is all done with a very standard venue and it's all the activities that take place there where the server is and where the players are is done this way and that's true of these other games too this is high ally that's um, cricket um, that is uh, that's tennis and that is basketball um, no that is soccer thank you or football whichever one you like uh, cars we're driving down this this is <laughs> as you can see the people on the left this means it's Britain um, but these uh, these venues are very carefully laid out so that we know if I'm placing myself here that means I'm turning left if I place myself here if I place myself in this thing right here it means you have to stop I mean that's what a zebra zebra crossing uh, tells you and so on here is uh, I, I because I was interested in these two guys here look at the uh, topography of Westminster Abbey I mean you by God have to sit in a particular place so if you're the Spencer family you sit there you don't sit over here you don't sit over there and so on so everybody has a place and you indicate who you are by um, where you sit well it's more than that you aren't allowed to sit where you aren't allowed to sit okay but there are also ad hoc temporary venues all over the place I've shown you one so people doing the TV stand uh, they were certainly doing that but just take two people sitting on a bench they have by sitting next to each other they have created a little ad hoc venue in which they're going to talk and there's a little interactive space you would not dare go and sit between them that's just not something you would do if they are seen to be uh, a little cu a couple actually uh, talking to each other uh, and there's a surround that says you don't walk up and stand right here either I mean that's just not something you do um, probably even in Sweden so but dyadic venues you've got things like this here are these two guys just standing next to each other and they define a little venue and you uh, uh, our this is a friend of ours Melissa Bowerman used to talk about how the Swedish uh, dyadic venue is just very different from all the rest that is there'd be two Swedes in the hallway and they'd be uh, you know five feet apart and here's someone else walking down the hallway how are you going to get you're not supposed to go between them you hate going between them but the Swedes were taking up the whole bloody hallway because uh, they stand so far apart and uh, as Melissa pointed out uh, most people you know they're standing about this far apart but no not the Swedes who are standing 
so far. But again, it says we feel uh, uh, there's, a, there's a kind of feel that you don't go in between there. And there these all have to do with personal spaces, too, that I'm not taking up, but uh, this is, it's all one uh, bit of stuff. And here we have uh, two people walking. And now the interactive space is much further in this way, and the venue is somehow much bigger because you're walking. Uh, and none of this should be surprising to anybody who's ever read Adam Kendon, because he has a really lovely discussion of exactly these sorts of uh, ad hoc venues and the way they work. So uh, he distinguished among vis-a-vis -vis L's and side-by-side -side venues, and they, they have different purposes, and you do different things in these uh, depending on what you're, which, depending on what you're doing, you will have, choose a different um, one of these three. He calls them F formations. So this is the, the, his version of this, these ad hoc temporary venues. Uh, but there are marked venues even here, and compare this one with this one. <laughs> now, in baseball, uh, the, this is a manager complaining. This is a manager. No, that's a manager complaining to an umpire. And you're not allowed to touch the umpire. If you do, you're thrown out of the game maybe for a month, a uh, long time. But they come within, uh, you know, inches of, uh, sorry, centimeters of uh, touching each other. That's highly marked, and they know it's marked. They do it be, to, uh, to mark it as something that's different from, let's call it, the unmarked um, ordinary uh, dyadic venue here. Uh, there are also ways that we maintain the venues, and I'm, again, there's good old William and Kate uh, who are walking, holding hands. Now, this is a way of keeping the walking together well, uh, well done. And, and anybody who's read Margaret Gilbert, uh, does she talk about this way of maintaining walking together? No. This is one terrific way of indicating that you're walking together and signaling that you, this is a tactile gesture of a sort. Uh, here, one person has the, her arm in his. Here, she's got her arm over her shoulder. Here, these guys are symmetrical. It's actually, this and this are symmetrical, and many of them are not symmetrical. It's, uh, who knows what each of these things means really, but almost certainly they mean something by being symmetrical or not. Anyway, these are, uh, uh, all of these are these indicative signals, and you can, so what I've been arguing here is you can signal things by pointing at items, placing items, uh, these three phases are important, and uh, the venues are important. I'm now going to take up a particular venue. No, I'm first of all going to give uh, my two friends S and J. Um, I promised them not ever to give their names. Um, but if you ask me, <laughs> I, might, I might tell you here. Um, anyway, this is S and J buying coffee at Starbucks. So the two of them walk in the door. What happens? They are. They are entering a place. And by entering this space, we signal that we intend to be customers at this Starbucks. Uh, they stand in line. I've already shown you this one. And by standing in this queue, we signal that we are waiting for service. By the way, I, uh, she left this queue very quickly, uh, <laughs> leaving everything to S uh, to do. And, uh, but, and by leaving. That cue, she said, in effect, there were people behind her saying, I am no longer waiting for service in this cue. And that's deplacing yourself from a place that you put yourself. It means something by the deplacement and maintaining themselves there, as I said. So here's a, uh, the woman behind the counter getting an order from S. And uh, by standing behind the counter, I signal I'm at your service. And then he, uh, uh, by placing money on the counter, uh, I transfer money to you for the purchase, and uh, by placing the bag on the counter, she places the bag with his pastry in it, uh, I transfer the pastry to you, and here is this thing that uh, most Starbucks have, where you place an order here, uh, but Starbucks is doing it, and it's to be placed for a customer, and they often don't know who the customer is, but here's the customer picking up his stuff here, and he's saying, by deplacing the coffee from this counter, I take possession of it. And 
uh, it's something that's just in every Starbucks or in lots of other places here. There will be this table full of condiments. And it's basically Starbucks has a permanent or semi-permanent uh, placement here of all of these objects um, by placing the condiments here on this counter. It's offering these items to any customer who comes up and wants them. And it's free for all. But it's a signal of a certain kind, and it's sustained and maintained by, the, by Starbucks. Um, they're at this table. And by that, they're saying, you know, we're uh, placing ourselves here. We signal that we claim this table and its contents for our use for the time being, as long as we're sitting here. Um, and she, good old Jay, puts uh, uh, a cup in the garbage, sorry, the rubbish, the, what, what, what's, what's the term that everyone in this room is, rubbish bin, how about that, rubbish bin. Um, I call it a trash bin. By placing this cup in the trash bin, I designate it to be trash. So as long as she has the cup with her, it's not trash. But as soon as she puts it in, the, in that bin, she is saying, I am, uh, I'm specifying this to be uh, trash. And that's just a placement issue. And here he leaves this thing. By leaving the space, I end my transaction with Starbucks. Um, OK. I now, I'm now coming to my very last um, series of things, and this is to go back to Tuesday. And so all of this is to baffle Nils, who was not here on Tuesday. Uh, but you're going to learn everything that you need to know without having had to come on Tuesday, you see. So this is easy. Places and venues in depicting. So depictions are a particular use of place. Um, and so uh, I'm going to talk about a stage venue. So uh, in sta on, st on the stage, you perform non-serious actions. Uh, in fact, you stage scenes. And these are all performed in staged scenes. And I'm going to go through them very quickly here. So I'm going to start with a real standard case, namely stage plays. Uh, and here's the Savoy Theater in London, where uh, this is a huge venue and it's got all these sub places here there's places for people to sit and here's there's a stage and what it doesn't show you here is there's a backstage uh, and there are there are aisles that you get to the, there's all this kind of stuff here and i'm only going to talk about the stage the stage looks something like this um, it will be up here and here's the auditorium uh, standard theaters all look like this uh, so uh, the people so here's baker in back here and here are, I'm going to um, I'm going to pick a particular performance here. This is some time ago with Peggy Ashcroft and Paul Robeson uh, doing Othello. So how is it with you, my lord? Uh, she says, and he says, well, my good lady. And here they are. Um, I pick Paul Robeson because he was one of America's great actors and long gone. Um, but anyway, they're standing. Uh, they're on the stage saying these things to each other and Baker is sitting back here in the auditorium now so what the hell is going on here well uh, there are two layers of uh, actions here there's the layer which is the current world of Robeson Ashcroft and Baker um, so you know this is it turns out this is 1930 let's say it's 1930 and it, so th there it is it's all happening in 1930 and but what is there is a second layer and namely, it's the layer of the depicted scene, namely the story world of Desdemona and uh, Othello. And in this particular scene, they're before the castle in Venice in around 1500. So we know, we all know the difference between these two things here. These are two different layers. Um, the way to think about this is to say, aha, here's the stage scene. Here's, this is Robeson and uh, Ashcroft. Um, and this, what they're trying to do is to get us to imagine this scene up here, which is another place that is analogous, precisely analogous to this place. By doing this, we're, they're creating this depicted scene up here. And remember the Pazun Peep principle, this is not, uh, this is not Othello and Desdemona. This is, Ashcroft and Robeson. This up here is what's depicted. 
and uh, it's depicted by, and so by doing this, they're creating this thing up here. And in fact, they do it be, by making a physical analog of it. So this is what ties it to what I was talking about on Tuesday. Depictions are physical analogs of the things depicted. And in the theater, it's really clear uh, how this works. That is, there is a one-to-one -one mapping between these two spaces. So the locations of people, the locations and the, the actions and the orientations, all of this, there's a mapping from there to there in a, in a straight analog way. Now, um, the thing is that these are co-present in some sense. That is, the Othello word, uh, world is distinct from the activity on the stage. So this, these are not the same, but it's created by the people down here. And this doesn't exist until this exists. And as soon as this stops existing, that stops ex being uh, existing too. That is, they are being done uh, at the same time because that's the way depictions work. So if you think of the dialogue between Desdemona and Othello, the one that I gave you earlier, it takes place. I mean, that dialogue itself is taking place in Venice in, 15, in, its, in its own local venue. But it's created by these guys in this stage saying their lines from Shakespeare. And that's how that uh, dialogue up there gets created. That's the way depictions work, is the argument. Now, the argument is, of course, it, this is what accounts for quotations, teasing, iconic gestures, demonstrations, and everything else that I talked about Tuesday. And I'm going to give you just I'm going to remind you of some things that I showed you on Tuesday, uh, except for this, this is all for Niels because, you know, he didn't get down here. So this is a woman, and she's talking about a friend of hers, and she's depicting a conversation between her and her friend Lo. And here it goes. I, I don't know, I asked her the bathroom and went out there, and she's all, you'll never guess who's in the office. And I was like, who? She's like, MTV. So this dramatization is not just of her, uh, of the speech. I mean, she's really giving the whole uh, conversation. In fact, if you deleted this, which I have tried to do on occasion, and you just hear her saying these two, uh, these three lines, you hear a real dialogue. I mean, there, it feels like three, two different people talking. Here's another one. This is the tease where this is not intended to be taken seriously. This is not. Um, yeah. You look beautiful. Thank you. Will almost wore that outfit. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that they decided that wouldn't be cool. So what they have done is to suddenly turn their little local venue into a staged venue. And it's got a stage there where he is saying, uh, Will almost wore that outfit here last night, and Will says, yes, I came this far from it, and then he decided. So they, they've staged a little scene in a place, but we are supposed to see this as not uh, them themselves. They are depicting a scene in which uh, she is being teased for doing this uh, in that way. And remember the guy smearing? You know, he's smearing his face with chili, but uh, so here he is doing this whole uh, thing. He's doing just exactly what a good actor is going to do. Namely, he's uh, become, he's no longer um, Conan O'Brien. He is that boyfriend. He is enacting that boyfriend, uh, you know, putting, smearing himself with all sorts of stuff. And that's a wonderful, um, so at, you think he is really just staying there, but actually he's somehow now on a different stage. I can make this really explicit in the next one here. This is uh, Malcolm Bilson again, and he's going to show you, he's going to enact somebody binking on a, on a piano. Bink, 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 bink. Now watch what he does. What I want you to watch, I'll show you this a couple of times, is he doesn't do this by going bink, bink, bink. He, he turns to the right. He turns to his right and goes bink, 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 bink. That is, the piano's over here, and he's doing this over here. He's not, he's taking himself out of the audience, so the space that he's doing his staging in is not 
the, state, the, the space that he and his audience are in, it's another space. It's one where the piano is out here and he's uh, looking at it this way. Now watch. All you have to do is say, look, there are four notes there, but it's not really very natural to go bing, 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 bing. That's all you have to do. So he's, he was addressing this woman's question who said, you know, what do you do with a, with a, a new pianist? All you have to do is say, look, there are four notes here, but it's not really very natural to go bing, 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 bing. That's all you have to do. Uh, and notice he says, uh, there are four notes here. And he's actually, uh, he's got this imaginary music out there, and he's got this imaginary piano, and he's doing all of this enactment on a stage that has these imaginary props on it. And that's the way he gets this stuff done. He doesn't just say these things. He doesn't just bink, and he doesn't just bink with his finger. He actually creates a stage where he first has the music and then has the piano that he does this on. OK, um, that's it. Uh, so people stage scenes to depict non-present scenes. So that's what all of these things had to do with. Uh, the stage scene is done in the current venue, but it always represents a depicted scene in a non-present venue. And we see this explicitly done in stage plays. That's the way stage plays work. That's the way children do pretend play just as much. They have these little uh, pretend venues that they do these things in. But it also counts for these other things that I talked about Tuesday. OK. Um, Summary, and you're going to say, oh, thank God. Um, or, or maybe thank God that we didn't get blasted by any um, cannons here. So um, two people acting jointly. Uh, every act, joint activity takes place in some venue or another because basically to do a joint activity defines a venue. And in some cases, the venue is already there, as in tennis, but it doesn't tell you the time of start and the time of end, but it is a restrictive kind of spatial place. Um, and venues contain these simplex places uh, for the participants, joint actions, and for paraphernalia of various sorts. And they afford indicative signals of two rough kinds. I mean, the pointing, so I can index, I can, uh, as I talked about yesterday, anchor myself to all sorts of things in this venue, um, that's what having a venue affords. But it also affords this positioning uh, bit. I can position things for my, uh, to, to get various of these things done. Um, joint activities require common ground. Common ground is established by anchoring to the current venue by these things here, places and the layers here. Uh, and anchoring requires these indicative signals namely pointing to and positioning for as a general division between these two. So, thanks. Before we go any further, I want to ask Neil, so what is this, what's the significance here? I think the black hills, I believe, is in South Dakota. And it's mantled that rather. Yes, and what more uh, is known about the black hills than that? Which is which one? Deadwood, Deadwood yes. Uh, and, then, then, and, then it's all, and then it's also known for being the birthplace of a number of well known. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of, not only Clark, but there are more. Oh, no, <laughs> I'm the only famous person from there. <laughs> no, they're never, they were never born there. They were killed there and they're buried there. <laughs> uh, this, you're thinking of Wild Bill and Calamity Jane. Anyway, so that is the significance of this. I had to get this off my chest. Thanks. Questions? I want to go back to your thesis that um, pointing and placing are not just context, but they are part of a dialogue. Yeah? That's your thesis. And, and I, that, I that think that's what? my. I, I didn't quite hear your thesis I mean, about the, my thesis. You, you said pointing in places are not just part of a context, they are part of the, yes. di as a, a yeah. dialogue. Yeah. I think you can make an even stronger claim. And that is, I mean, well, okay, there is an old saying 
uh, saying, the obvious goes without saying. Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Yeah, uh, which means that you can do a lot of things without, do, without saying anything. And for instance, in your movie of this, this couple putting together the um, TV yeah. table the, or whatever. Uh, yeah. thing that you I mean, were, they, they, they were He was pointing to the screwdriver, she put it forward. Yeah. So the obvious goes without saying. That is, they can do a lot of things it's, uh, without any verbal communication. Then sometimes verbal communication is needed. So you, should, you could say that um, the, the dialogue uh, is, part of, uh, uh, is part of the coordination or, or the co collaboration. So you, you put the collaboration in focus and then the dialogue is the uh, added value. You, you, in, in the, I'm sorry, the spoken, di spoken dialogue, I'm sorry, yeah. So, uh, so you, you're going to give priority to one of these two things over the other, the speech over in, the... In, in your thesis, gestures. it sounds like the dia dialogue is the, the one in focus. I'm, I'm turning the focus around. So uh, I hope you remember Tuesday where I was arguing that there's a lot of times when the depictions are subordinate or are secondary to utterances, and then there are all the cases, and there are a lot of them, where they are the primary thing that you're doing. That is, it's, the depiction is, and that's going to be true of placement as well, and, and pointing. I just, uh, I'll give you, and hold on, um, for people picky like you, I come with, I come prepared. Um, that was not a criticism, that was actually a compliment here. You should take, this is a compliment. Um, I have a, a principle in this original paper that I talk about, which actually is the phenomenon you, I think, were alluding to here. And let's see if I can find the, um, the principle. Maybe someone else should ask a question while I'm looking for this, but I'm not going to find it, I think, very quickly. The point, actually, is, uh, the, so this is something that S. Uh, who's a very famous guy in HCI, uh, he said to me once, he said, Herb, uh, you know, the obvious point here is that uh, what is it that you mean when you're doing, you're placing something on the counter? So remember, there's this whole uh, interaction that the, the server and I go through. So I place the book on the book, on the, on the counter. What does it mean? And he says, as he points out, it is the preparation that you're doing for the next move in the joint activity. I, I, that's the way I translated what he argued. And this is absolutely right. So placing the book at that point in the joint activity is understood in relation to the stage at which you're at in that joint activity. And that's what it means. And that's the same thing with the pointing. Uh, he, was, he was about to do something, and so he points at that screwdriver, and then she holds out the screwdriver. She's figuring out he is now preparing himself for the next move, and that's what that point would mean. That's true for all of these things, but it's also just as true for the language. So uh, later in this conversation in the drugstore, I said uh, something like, two cents. And uh, what I was doing is pulling out of my pocket two pennies. And she says, at some other place. She says, two cents. She doesn't, it's not two cents, but you know, a dollar, or whatever it was. And what she was doing is giving me change. That is, in both cases, we were talking, we were referring to money with a very simple phrase, two cents and, you know, dollar forty-four. But for me, I was giving it to her, I was offering it to her, and for, she, for her, it was, she was giving it back to me in change. These all got interpreted only in relation to the fact that we were in the um, exchanging money part of the, of the interaction where she was going to give me back money. So my argument would be that the speech is just as dependent on where you are in the joint activity in exactly the same way. It is what you need to do to get to the next step. And as my friend S pointed out, this is also true for all the cases of the of the placement here. Um, yeah. So if you say it, it goes without saying, I, I mean, I, I, you're just struck by how, how we have been uh, forever taken 
we, we take all these people seriously who say what is in the discourse is all just in the speech and then they try to explain all kinds of crazy things that go on in the speech when in fact I am taking actions and she's taking actions at, at, as we go along that are just as much a part of the discourse as the speech is and sometimes even more crucial to the discourse and they're, they're just as much signals and they're doing just the, the same kind of preparation for the next stage. So uh, by preparation for the next stage you typically mean I am trying to get your agreement on a joint commitment to the next stage and that's the yeah, way we do all, it. All, all what you're saying now supports my, my idea that it's the activity that's the, it's the primary and the dialogue is something that you need in order to fulfill it rather than taking the dialogue as primary and, and having context as something that helps it. So. Yeah, I, I guess that's what I thought the argument was on Monday entirely. Yeah, that okay. is you start but, with a joint activity and you ask how do you get it? But that's the stronger than the thesis you formulated. That's more. Uh, it's stronger than which form? The, the, the formulation that you said that the pointing is uh, not just context, uh, f context for the dialogue. It's a part of the dialogue. That's all what you said. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure that we disagree. We don't disagree. Here. No, no, oh, no. Oh, good, okay. good. Yeah. Okay. When uh, Searle talks about institutions, he says that they're all discursively um, created. And then someone points out, a reviewer points out that, well, what about all the things that you do without words, like placing a beer on a counter. And then Searle says, well, this is a text analog, so it's actually discourse, so I'm, I'm still right. What do you make of that argument? Uh, I, I'm afraid for uh, hostility from the right here if I say anything <laughs> nasty about uh, I think I would think exactly what I believe you probably are implying by asking the question. I mean, the, yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> now, so he's, uh, here's, uh, Searle is, uh, you know, good old Searle, he's, um, he is uh, very confident about the arguments that he wants to make and so the best way to deal with the kind of argument that you and I would be making here, which is there's all this, uh, these physical performances that are treated, considered, and are signals of various sorts, he would say, well, they're just substitutes for text, and we can make a textual version of this. The problem is that there's all the stuff I talked about on Tuesday, you cannot make textual versions of. They, that's the whole point of them. They, so he has this, um, uh, ineffable or effability, ineffability argument mm -hmm. that uh, there's nothing that's ineffable and of course the whole point about depictions is that they are, that's the intrinsic part of them, they are ineffable. They cannot be described, they are not descriptions. But even if they are ineffable, couldn't you still say that they play the role of in a symbolic system that still allows you to interpret well, they, them and that they do is ex So remember what I was saying is that if you look at um, these depictions, they have this internal structure. For example, mm -hmm. here's Bilson playing on the piano, but they also have an external structure. That is, this is used as an NP in that sentence, that utterance, the utterance of that sentence. Well, externally, yes, I mean, this all works to, uh, to to Sir, I mean, Cyril can do all that. What he can't do is to tell you what's happening internally. What is it that is denoted by that depiction internally? Well, that's, a, uh, that's the kind of thing that just doesn't fit anything that he's ever even remotely thought about, let alone uh, written about, as far as I know. I but, yeah. So I want to come back to um, <laughs> Peter's uh, version of your thesis. As you know, I'm already a firm believer in the fact that, that um, pointing and, and placement and so on is not context. It is yeah. part of the joint activity that is communication. But I want to ask the Max Planck Institute Language and Cognition Group question, 
which is, and, and in fact you hinted at this uh, partly to yourself um, in various places in the, in the talk, whether the structures and the orders and the sequences and so on necessarily are the same everywhere. So here's an anecdote. Are what everywhere? The same. The same everywhere. So here's an anecdote. If you go to Belgium, and you oh, go to... Dreadful. Why would yes, you do no, that? Well, why would you? But imagine you find yourself yeah. in Brussels. Yeah. And you are in a bookstore and you, you go through some of the sequences that you've shown us, how they're done in California. Um, you get to the point where the um, person behind the counter hands you back some change and says, s'il vous plaît. Now, if you're a French speaker and you've been in France, this is a moment of great confusion to you because when you say s'il vous plaît in France, it means that you're asking something of the person. Whereas in Belgium, they, in Belgium, they say s'il vous plaît as they are handing something to you, which is actually just a sort of a calque of what they would do in Dutch where they would say alstublieft. Right. right. This is very, very confusing. And, so that, and I've seen this a number of times. It leads to all kinds of... Um, peculiar side sequences or whatever you want to call them. So there's a, there's a cultural violation or a violation of, of something there that, that sets off problems, suggesting that the combination of speech and, and actions and so on um, may not necessarily have the same form everywhere. And of course, everybody who's ever been to Turkey and tried to do these sorts of things without speaking Turkish, I mean, we all have these experiences. So. I suppose the question is, what, what, are you claiming anything about um, general sequences uh, for these different kinds of placement positioning for things? Or what is the room, what's the leeway for cultural variation? Um, I, well, I, I've seen exactly the kind of thing. I actually have a slightly different version between American and British English. So you, uh, I go in and and buy something for, um, so for a hundred kroner, I, I uh, and no, it's only 75, and so I, I hand, in America, if I hand a $20 bill to, to a clerk and she is gonna give me $5 back, then she will not say thank you. She, uh, we go, so she'll take it and then she'll give it back to you and then you say thank you. But in Britain, you hand this to them and they say, well, thank you. And you think, I've just, been, I've just lost that five dollars, that five pounds. Um, so there is this, uh, so there, there are conventions that go along with all of these. Uh, this is a standard venue and it has standard kinds of um, verbal and nonverbal things that go th through the whole, uh, the whole thing. And uh, I have no reason to think that they don't vary all over the place. Uh, in America, you do not uh, bag your own groceries. Uh, that's done for you by somebody here. Uh, well, no, let's put it in the Netherlands. If you aren't there bagging up your groceries by the time it's coming through, uh, you'll never, uh, you know, the the woman behind the counter will then glare at you and say, you know, you idiot, why aren't you doing this? So there are different conventions all over the place. What will be the same, one assumes, is that there's a certain kind of work that you have to do. Mm -hmm. You have to, uh, she has to, I mean, let's take the clerk being a she, uh, sorry, I, she has to see what things that you're buying. She has to indicate, she has to figure out what they cost. She has to tell you what they cost. You have to give the money to her. She has to give the money back and we have to get the goods out of the store. So those are things, and there are certain sequential properties there that they just have to be done sequence that a person can't know how much you need to pay until they've looked at the goods and they can't bag the goods until they have uh, looked at the goods to see what goods that you're going to um, buy and so on so there there are some real constraints on this those will be probably um, uh, constrained in some culturally specific way, but they will still be in that, they'll, there will be an order that's constrained in that way. And it's not all that different from lots of language things, so I, before I ask you, um, would you, uh, before I ask, um, before I hand you some, a drink, I have to say, would you like a drink? I, I don't hand you the drink and say, would you like a drink? I mean, that's the wrong order. 
uh, because th there's a contingency in the way things are done. So uh, all, I, this is, all this is to say, of course there are conventions all over the place and they vary by country and vary by everything. I basically wanted you to say it is like language because, I mean, this is one of the things that if you're dealing with the non-spoken part, not discourse or interaction or whatever, but the non-spoken part, um, very often people somehow think that the non-spoken part doesn't follow conventions in the same way as, say, spoken language. Yeah. Right? So, if, so if that's what you're trying to get me to say, then fine, of course. You did. Thank yeah. you. Uh, so uh, the, the fact, just the difference between the Dutch and the American who packs, who does the bagging of the groceries, that's a simple convention. It's, and every Dutchman knows you go in and you bag your own groceries. And every American knows you don't do that. In some parts of America, you don't carry your own groceries out to the car or out to wherever you're going. That's done for you by somebody. And in some parts of the country, you have to pay this guy a little tiny bit to do this. Um, we happily don't live in that sort of a... Uh, we live in a sensible part of the U.S. that's <laughs> called California, <laughs> uh, although California isn't always sensible either. No, I always have a question because. Okay. 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 <clears throat> okay. So I'm from a completely different field. Um, it's about architecture and urban planning. Architecture. Architecture, yes. Ah, good for you. And I love I, this. But now I realize, I, it occurs to me that maybe it's not that different. I mean, you could see architecture and urban planning as communicative acts as well. So They're permanent could, ones. They're permanent so you're putting ones. putting down permanent signals all yes. over the place. And so that was, that's my question is, could you see architecture? <laughs> Hang on, <laughs> let me. <I've laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, ha can you see architecture and urban planning as acts of placement? I mean, take for instance, uh, you um, uh, design a building and, uh, it, and it's located, uh, uh, it's a coffee shop, it's located in the city center. Right. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, uh, this is some kind of sustained permanent signal and uh, saying that the city planner who has uh, made the uh, location uh, wants us to leave our homes and uh, meet up in the city and make it more livable. Uh, yeah, well, my question is, have, have you ever thought of, I mean, this, uh, uh, using this, uh, I mean, your theory in, in uh, the archi field of architecture and, and urban planning? So the answer is, I mean, seriously, no, but informally, yes. That is, yeah. the same guy, S, who is, uh, he's been one of my closest friends for 45 years, have discussed all these things because he worried about exactly these things. So you take a building and you want the front door to be something that, uh, the whole front of the building to be designed such that people coming down will be funneled into that front door and that's a matter of how, how you designed the placement of the, of the sidewalk and everything to get you into there, as opposed to um, how many buildings have, do we know where the grand front entrance is not an entrance at all. You have to go in some side door because the grand front entrance is no longer uh, one of these entrances. That's one thing, but uh, if you look at the interior design, for I, what I have done is to look at grocery stores. They are very, very carefully designed by uh, architects so that you are drawn through each of these lines. And uh, to, to take a simple example, um, uh, what I haven't shown you is uh, take something like beans. Now, let's take baked beans. Now there's a company uh, called Campbell's that puts baked beans into a can. Now, so they are responsible for the placement in this can, but the can is now by itself something that, say Safeway, uh, a grocery, uh, takes and puts on a particular shelf. Now the shelf is called, uh, you know, baked goods or, you know, canned goods or something like that, which is on a particular aisle that's, that has canned goods and not the cereals and not the uh, fruit and vegetables, 
they are very carefully put in, in various parts of the store. There's a hierarchy of the kind that I talked about with the, um, with the table, the chairs, and in, a, in, a, um, in the restaurant that have exactly this property. Um, they're very neatly designed. So in every, I don't know whether this is true for grocery stores here, in every American grocery store, the milk is in the back. And that's to force you to go all the way through all the other aisles and buy stuff on your way in and out just to get the milk. And because everybody who goes to a grocery store wants milk, apparently. Uh, but So you're right. Uh, actually, this guy S would have a much more elaborate and articulate answer to that question. He has thought about it a lot. That is, uh, you want to design program, uh, so for internet sort of things, you want to design it such that uh, you draw people into where they need to go first and then where they need to go second. And this is all engineering of the architecture of the, of the site in the way that you do this, uh, what pages you see first, I mean, if you think of it uh, virtually. So the answer is yes. I mean, I, uh, I wish I had more to say than that, but I don't. OK, thank you. I guess before we close, I'd like to give you one piece of paper. Ooh. Thank you. Thank you, thank <laughs> you, thank you very you, much thank for four <laughs> very interesting lectures. And a piece of paper uh, to the display. piece of paper? Oh, probably. good, good. And uh, if you pref prefer more solid uh, oh tokens my of God. our appreciation. So th this, is, uh, <laughs> this is a picture of this guy yeah, with yes. all the hair uh, <laughs> that you saw exactly. earlier. And he has even more hair there. Look at this. Yeah, it's <laughs> I guess if you're a really famous lawyer, you can afford all that hair. <laughs> or it was very cold in those days. Yeah. Thank you very right, thank much. You much. It's been a pleasure having uh, you as an audience. Thank you. And I expect you to go out and spread the word. <laughs> or the gesture, I don't know, whichever one. <laughs>